Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our home church. Let us prepare our heart toward heaven. Let us sing a song, holy song, page 119. Long road to freedom. 119. Long road to freedom. It's a long road to freedom, a winding steep and high. But when you walk in love with the wind on your wings, the color of the earth and the songs you sing, the miles fly by. I walked one morning by the sea. As the waves reached out to me, I took their tears.
stand up about the happy parents, God and true parents. Today is Sunday morning, um, June 17, 2018. That's us about the heavenly father and true parents. In bed. Hello. <coughs> We are grateful to receive a new day and a new week. We are preparing our heart to heaven to receive your guidance and your truth. Through that, we can encourage ourselves to be your beautiful son and daughters. We are grateful to true Father discovered the many things we didn't know, the fundamental question, who we are, and uh, how, how to uh, change this world to be peaceful world. So many things, so many questions that uh, are popping out our head, but never understand to, uh, to understand the answer. Through the search of the truth and uh, spiritual spiritual truth, and guided by you, so many people was the receiving your yeah, um, life element and uh, change the life. We had uh, in the New York some uh, cab uh, pe people using Uber or yellow cab. And people suicide. That recently, I heard the news. That if we found this truth, maybe he couldn't, didn't die that 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 time. We really sorry. People losing hope and the dying for 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 that. We this world is full of. Full of um, misery, full of sad, uh, sadness. We really bring uh, uh, truth to the people who can realize we can change the circumstance with uh, dedicational heart and love and sacrifice. Please guide this time to reflect our life and the determine. Please guide our pastor can give us the guidance through, through the world, your world and truth and uh, we can uh, <coughs> produce goodness around us. Please guide us. Thank you very much. Your love and your truth guided by the true Father. And uh, we are so precious to receive. Please guide us. Thank you very much. I report in the name of Raman and Tamiko Montanaro, Blessed Central Family, Aju. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Please sit it. Welcome our pastor Montanaro. Okay, so today um, I want to title my sermon The Evolution of Eve. The Evolution of Eve. Eve, of course, was the first woman, at least according to the Bible. Of course, in Hebrew, Adam simply means man, and Eve means mother, or mother of all living. It's like, they have meaning, the names Adam and Eve have meaning, but we look at Eve as the prototype, or the first woman. And I want to talk about Eve's development and evolution. Now you may say, well, you're a man, how can you talk about women? What do you know about women? Actually. It's easier for a man to understand women than for women to understand women. And there's a great line in one of my favorite movies, one of my, not my favorite movies, but P.S. I Love You, which you might have seen, with Hilary Swank and uh, Harry Connick Jr. is asking her, what do you women want? <laughs> you know, what do you women want? And he goes, come here, I'll tell you, it's a secret. You can't promise not to tell anyone. And she goes, we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> you know? And, uh, it's a great, it's a great line, you know, because actually you can't see yourself. 
Uh, the eye is not built to see itself. The eye is built to see other things. So you can't see yourself. So actually the best person, and actually it's true, right? If, if a woman starts talking about men and what, what kind of man she wants, all men are listening, right? Men want to know what women think about men, what women want in men, because that's what we want as a woman. So if a woman wants this kind of man, we want to be that kind of man. And the same thing is true for women. If men start talking about what women, what, what they want in a woman, what, what women are to them, women are all listening, you know? So you need the opposite side to teach you sometimes what you are. You can't see yourself. So I think that was actually Father's greatest gift in a way. Father probably spoke more about women than men in his, entire, in his lifetime, in his speeches. He spoke about human responsibility, but he often focused on women and what their responsibility was and who they were, especially in America. Today, we were talking in our, ser in our sermon so far, we had three songs. And actually, they were all American songs. And the last one, If Life Were Gracious Enough, is one of the most beautiful songs ever written in the unification movement. I think if I had to vote for a song that was the most beautiful song written in the American movement, that would be that song. It's incredibly beautiful, the last song we say. Now, I thought about that. That song was written in the 1970s by some of the early members in Oakland. Oakland, California was the place that our movement blossomed. It really took root and blossomed. And thousands, literally thousands and thousands of people came through the workshops every, every weekend. And they, all the members would go to the land up in Northern California, in the Napa Valley. They would go to the land up there and they would, um, they would have a workshop, a two-day workshop. And everybody would go to the two-day workshop again and again and again and again. And they would bring guests with them. And it was like a celebration. And there were hundreds of people at these workshops. And literally, hundreds of people would join every year. Thousands. I think, well, I think the count was like 1,800 people that remained in the movement had joined an Oakland family. Which was 10 times more than anywhere else in the country. Oakland was this, was this amazing uh, culture. Um, and joy, joyful and cheerful. And it was very feminine. Father talks about the, um, in fact, the leader of it was a woman, really. The, the, the Korean missionary that Father had sent to California, to Northern California. Uh, they called her Oni Durst, or, but because she was married to Dr. Durst, Mose Durst, who was the first, second president of our church in America. So her name was Durst, but she was Korean. And they called her Oni. And that she was actually the core, the center. She had spent two years walking around San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley, like a, like a homeless person. People thought she was like a homeless person because she'd be like muttering and talking to herself because she was praying the whole time for two years without fighting anybody. She just was praying and praying and praying for the cities. And there's millions of people that live in the Bay Area, right? But she was praying for the Bay Area. And then she found like these really prepared people that were so prepared spiritually. And then they became the core of the leadership of the Oakland family. Matthew and Matthew Morrison and his sister. Yet there were three Morrisons that joined, and Christina, uh, Sarah, Christina. These different. I wasn't part of the Oakland family. So I don't know their names very well. Noah Ross was a lecturer. He was like a very well educated man and very good at lecturing. And there were very many really powerful people that came around her. Dr. Durst. He was a PhD. I think in uh, psychology or philosophy or something like that. He was, he was very um, educated and he became the, the leader of the Oakland family externally. But she was the core. So it was very feminine. The word only is an interesting word too. And Father finally broke it up, I think, for this reason. It was too feminine. It, it, didn't, it didn't recognize Father enough. It recognized Mother more. It was like recognizing only the feminine aspect, not really recognizing the masculine. It was emphasizing the feminine too much. But his reasons for that, for one thing, the founder was a woman. And the calling her Oni also is very interesting. To Koreans, it was very strange. Because Oni means older sister, which is fine. But it means older sister by a girl. A girl says to her older sister, Oni, Oni. So like you would call Alyssa Oni, you'd say Alyssa Oni, and you would say Alyssa Oni, or you'd say Sunny Oni, like that. You say the name with Oni at the end, and it means older sister, Sunny, older sister, Alyssa. 
So calling Oni Durst Oni is fine if you're a woman. But when the men were using and all the men were using it, it for Korean ear, it was really strange. It was like everyone was a woman. They, they should have taught, when a girl, guy says Nuna. So they should have at least said, the guy should say Nuna to Nuna Durst. You know, Nuna. Nuna is what a boy calls his older sister. So th there was something wrong. It was a little bit off. Just a little bit off. But anyway, a little bit off. But the amazing thing was that, in spite of the fact there are some things and mistakes, and there's always going to be mistakes, because as we go grow out of our fallen nature, our sinful state, as we inherit Father's teaching and become more solid, we realize that the way we were following Father before needs to change, needs to grow. And that the things we did and the way we were following Father was wrong sometimes. And you're going to have to see that in your life, that you have evolution, growth. But in spite of the mistakes, the Oakland family was incredibly successful and incredibly good in many ways. Like that song, many songs were written. Almost all the songs that we sing in our songbook that were written in our movement were written in the Oakland family. They sang and sang and sang. And they were creative. there was a creative spirit. Joshua Cotter joined in Oakland family, and he was incredibly creative. He was, he was training to be a jazz pianist, and he was practicing for 10 hours a day, he told me. That's all he did with his life, was practice piano. He loved playing the piano. And suddenly he met our movement, and he had to give everything up. He gave everything up to join our movement, but he was still very musical. So he wrote many of the songs in our movement, also Joshua Cotter. So all these creative, intelligent, powerful people joined. And then after that, nothing. For the last 40 years, 40 years, since the Oakland family's heyday, almost no Americans have joined. We've had incredible results in Malaysia and the Philippines. has been incredible the amount of people joining our movement in Africa. In, uh, in Asia, in Japan even, people join somewhat. In Korea, sometimes people are joining. They're joining, you know, steadily. But in America, except for we had some, many ministers and their congregations coming close to us, but not really understanding principle as the core of their philosophy or ideology. Why? And thought, I want to talk about that. We talk about the title based Evolution of Eve. The Oakland family, one last thing I want to say about it is this. When I went to Korea, I was surprised to learn that the Koreans put a lot of faith in something called jihak, the study of land, the study of the land. They believe that mountains are very masculine. They believe water is feminine. So they, they have this very very deeply developed understanding or philosophy of, la of studying land formations and how they affect your spirit. So the most feminine configuration to a Korean is a bay or a, like, a, like a pond or a lake or an inlet, some kind of water that's enclosed. Like the ocean is feminine too, but it's very wild. But when you come into, like, let me give you an example so you understand what I mean. Chirisan is in South Korea, just, just south of where I was living. I was living in Cheonju, which is one of the southern capitals, about three hours south of Seoul. Just south of me, there was a land configuration called Chirisan, which was a series of mountains like this, in a horseshoe shape. And not high mountains, hills, really, more than mountains, like hills like this, in a horseshoe shape. And in the middle there was a mound, like a bump. And there was a temple there, a Buddhist temple. And there was a stream that flowed right out of that mound, right out of that gap between the mountains. And the configuration is just like a woman's womb. It is just like a woman's womb. It's, it's circular. It has liquid water coming out, you know. And there's a little mound in the top. And it's just like a womb. And Koreans have pilgrimages to this place when they want to get pregnant. From thousands of years ago, they would come to this place to pray to God to give them a baby. When the, when the women wanted to have a baby, they would go to this place because it's a very feminine configuration. And the energy of the land, the Koreans believe the energy is conducive to women's giving birth and this whole thing. On the other hand, Pek, Pek Tusan, White Top Mountain, and the mountain ranges in the north are very masculine. And Kim Il-sung, in order to emphasize his... Um, 
his role, his like his mythical almost image as the founder of Korea, believed that he was born on Pektusan or something like that. He came out of heaven on Pektusan or something. Mm -hmm. It's very masculine. See, the, the mountains are masculine, and the, the earth is feminine, the softer, especially the water, like a lake. Oakland, California, is on the most feminine spot in the United States, where the Oakland family was based. San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. The, the Marin County comes down from the north, so if, I'll do it for you. So this is the, uh, for you, the Pacific Ocean is here, right? And then this is the west coast of California. And then, so the west coast, the Napa Valley is here, and it comes down, and it makes a peninsula like this. And this is Marin County, one of the wealthiest counties in the United States now. And Marin County goes up, and then there's a bay here. And then there's another peninsula. This is where San Francisco is, on this peninsula. And then that goes down to Los Angeles, and, and that area, that was like six hours later, you know. So there's a little gap of water between the, where the bay lets out into the ocean, you know, the bay is, has tides. That's where the Golden Gate Bridge crosses over, yeah. okay? So that, that's like a womb, just like the Chitty side. It's like a womb. Mm -hmm. It's like a body of water. And that's why, that's one of the main reasons why 1,800 of our members join, because that's where birth can happen. That's where new life can come, is in a woman's womb. So that area has a womb's spirit. And that's why it was a feminine kind of movement, too, that was there. And women take care of young children more than men do, so that it was a perfect place for birth and growth to happen. Later on, Father would take those members and send them out all over the United States and even over the world as missionaries. So once they grew up in that nice feminine place, they could have more masculine influence and get sent out. Again, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm touching on some themes here that are going to make some of my listeners, especially American women, upset. And I don't mean to upset anybody. I just want to speak the truth. So if I'm not speaking the truth, then I hope you could call me out. But if I'm speaking the truth, then please listen and realize I'm not trying to upset or offend anybody. But what I'm going to say, and I've already started saying it, you're seeing how I'm pointing out the differences between men and women, the roles of men and women, women as nurturers, women as mothers. In modern society, we're losing that completely. In fact, it's being not just lost, it's being thrown away. It's being, it's being thought of as archaic, as patriarchal, as um, the wrong way of thinking, and that this modern idea of gender um, decision, like you can decide what gender you are, has taken over our country. The last election, Hillary Clinton came this close to being elected. It's the closest a woman has ever come to being elected the president of the United States. There was not even a, a, a hint of a woman running for president in the first 200 years of the United States history. The first president, George Washington, was elected in 1792. So if you think until 1992, there, there was no hint. Hillary Clinton came in the White House in 1992 as the first lady, and she was there for eight years. So based on that and based on her being a senator of New York, which was really just a setup for her to become president, she ran for president as, you know, having experience and that kind of thing. I won't go into politics here, but I will say this, that this whole idea that women, you know, there's a famous song my mother used to sing for me, I can do anything you can do better. It's a, it's a man-woman sort of song, you know. Anything you can do, I can do too. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. It's from a musical, I forgot, well, maybe Oklahoma or something like that. And, um, I forgot, I don't know musicals that well, but it's, it's a song that, from the 1940s or 50s that showed this idea of, of the, the battle of the sexes. The battle of the sexes. But what are we trying to win? Why is there a battle? Should there be a battle of the sexes? The women are trying to get out from underneath what they see nowadays as Thousands of years of oppression. Now, women have been oppressed by men for thousands and thousands of years. They've been forced to do housework and cleaning and treated like a slave. And it's true that in the United States, for instance, women couldn't vote until the 1900s. In fact, the, the, the black vote was restored before women's vote. Black people could, black men could vote before women could vote. 
Black women couldn't vote until women could vote. But black men could vote by, by U.S. constitutional amendment a few years right before that women could vote. Women weren't allowed the right to vote. So it shows, what does that show you about the thinking? Men were thinking women's role is in the home. They don't understand the world of politics. They don't understand the world of, of government. They don't understand the world of the economy. They understand their home. That's their province, their area. You know, and they would leave that to the women. They wouldn't even go in the kitchen. Their kitchen was the woman's domain. In Korea, he, when I was there, you, a man wouldn't set foot in the kitchen. You can't go in there. It's, it's a woman's domain. You can't go in there and take snacks out of the fridge. No. The woman is responsible for food. And she's responsible for everything in the house. Now, nowadays, that's seen as a backwards or archaic way of thinking. But let's look at that. Okay, this was, the, this was the role that women had. Men thought that. Now, there's some truth in that. There's some truth in that. Now, does that mean women are not intelligent? No. Women, women can understand politics if they want to. In other words, women can become a man. My point is this. Let me explain what I'm trying to say. The masculine nature and feminine nature, let's look at that first. Let's talk about big, big principles. God is a being of the harmonized character, of dual characteristics of masculine and feminine in harmony. Within God are masculine and feminine in harmony. When God created the universe, though, God created his own counterpart, an object for his love. The universe became like the object for God's love. The universe, then, the principle says, is from the viewpoint of, of the whole universe, God is the internal masculine subject, and the universe is God's feminine external object. So we've heard the idea of Mother Earth, right? Mother Earth. That's true. The Earth is a mother. Even Father talked about the Earth being the mother. And he said, if you don't love nature, if you can't love Mother Earth, you can't love God. Because if you can't love your mother, you can't love your father. Your mother is the link to your, to your father. So Mother Earth is actually accurate. But rather than saying Mother Earth, we could say Mother Universe, or the Universal Mother. In India, that's recognized uh, as being one of the forms of God, the Universal Mother, Maya. Uh, it's like the, but it's chaotic and wild and energy, this kind of thing. You know, it's a, a, a feminine energy, you know. But actually, the, the Bible says the same thing, right? Let's look at Genesis. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the earth was without form and void. And so that you have, and the waters are in the deep. That represents the feminine aspect of God, the energy that God has. Then God's Spirit moves in and organizes it and shapes it. So energy, we, we talk about the feminine aspect of energy when we talk about the law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. And it says that energy seeks absolute disorganization. It, it seeks the widest possible dispersal. You light a match here, the heat doesn't stay around here. The heat will have give and take with the air until the heat spreads into the whole room. The energy tends to want to spread out. Women's nature, and the nature of femininity, is energy and life, and this whole idea of, of, um, of nurturing life. The universe was created by God, in other words, as his feminine object. God is like the husband, and the universe is like the wife. Of course, within God are masculine and feminine. But then God created the universe, and the universe is God's feminine object. And the earth, especially this ball, this sphere that we're all standing on, is like the womb of the universe. 
for his children. And then God's love comes into the womb, into the earth. And over thousands of years of evolution, God's love formed all the animals and plants until the whole earth was a garden, beautiful garden. And then he created his children, Adam and Eve. Not like a magician, poof, where these Adam and Eve pop, pop, come out of the ground, which is how many Christians think that God, from the dust of the earth God created his flesh. And then he breathed the Spirit of God right into his nostrils, the Bible says. But we can understand that symbolically. That means that God took, our body comes from the earth. And, for, and that's why it's from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Out of dust you were born, unto dust you shall return, the Bible says. When we die, our body returns to dust. And our spirit goes to heaven, the spiritual world. So, what does that mean? It means that God took the, the earth. We know that before there was life, everything was just matter, dust, you know, mud, you know, stuff, clay. And he formed the first life out of it by giving cellular structure, one-celled animals in the ocean. Feminine again, right? The wombs, water, right? There's, we're, we're, we're born in a, a bag of water. When we first conceived, the, the, the womb forms a bag of water, salty water, just like the ocean. And we are swimming for 10 months, 10 lunar months. That's why for the, the, the Koreans say that we're, we're in the womb for 10 months because they're counting lunar calendar of 28 days. Actually, from the moment of the first day of the last menstrual period until birth was 280 days, 10 times 28. So it's actually 10 lunar months. Very interesting, right? 10 is the number of perfection, and the moon is the feminine symbol. The sun is the masculine symbol. So you have the, the, the lunar month governing women, and women's period cycle is about 28 days, right? So you have 10 period cycles to give birth. That's a perfection, right? It's very interesting, and it's not coincidence. It's not coincidence. So the woman, it creates a, a salty bag, like the, like the ocean. It's salt water. And then the placenta is there, and then the woman feeds the placenta, and the placenta feeds the baby. And the baby's growing with the placenta. And then when the baby's born, he's still attached, or she's attached to the placenta with the umbilical cord. And the first thing the doctor does is, clamp that and cut it off. So then the placentas, now it's used for research and things like that, but usually traditionally it was thrown away. Animals eat it. Animals will eat the, the placenta when it's born. Many animals, most of them, I think. They eat, the, they lick and clean them, they eat everything. But the point is that, that the thing that we're relying on for life, that placenta is right there giving us life, energy and all the food of... So that's we. If you think of a fetus, it's, it's very attached to that placenta. But when it's born, it's cut off from that. Same thing with our physical body here, where we're living in this physical body for ten decades, maybe right? Not ten months, but ten decades. And then when we die, when we get old and we die, then we sh we shuffle off this mortal coil. I think Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, when we get rid of our body then our body goes back to dust, to the earth, and our spirit goes on. So our body is like the placenta. Our spirit is growing on the foundation of our body. And then when we go to spirit, we don't need the placenta anymore. We don't need this physical body anymore. And we can go to spiritual world. So that's, that's our, our um, the kind of a nutshell. That's our life, right? Our life cycle. In the, in the water bag, in the air bag and in the love bag, Father said. In the spirit world, we live on love. We breathe love. So if you're not a loving person and you go to spiritual world, you're not ready, you're not prepared. You're, you're going to be limited in what you can do and where you can go because you're afraid of people, you're afraid of things, and you've created a selfish little bubble. But if you go out of that bubble and all the time break the bubble and love everyone you meet, when you go to spiritual world, that same love will let you be free. So you have to live your life in love, Father said. Okay, that's a nutshell of our life cycle. But looking at the relationship between man and woman in that, God is the invisible, masculine subject, and the universe is God's external, visible, feminine object. Subject and object relationship. Initiation, response. So the, the energy of love comes from God into the universe, giving it life. And then that, that joy comes back to God from the universe as the universe 
multiplies that life and makes it come to greater form, right, as it grows. This is a cycle of love. So the universe is like God's wife. Then who, did the, when the husband and wife love each other, what happens? Baby happens. So in the womb, which is this airbag here, this earth, his children were born. We're God's children. We're in this protected environment of the earth until we get, reach 100 years old, and then we go to spiritual world. And then we can, be with, we can meet God. You see, we're inside mother right now. We're inside our mother right now. When we pray, we're trying to let our voice be heard through the wall of the, of the womb. Like we're kicking, you know? Yeah, we're kicking. Like, you can see when the baby kicks, you can sort of see the, the outline of his foot. You know, pushing against the wall. He's a little foot. That's so adorable. You know, <laughs> little foot to the foot. You know, or you know, little fist. Beep, beep. The mother's like, "Ow, stop it!" But you know, keep, you know. <laughs> not alien. Okay, calm down. Okay, come on, the baby. Come on. So, anyway, the 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 baby is in there for ten months. So we're inside our mother right now. We're inside Mother Earth. We're inside the universe. That's why many religions only see that. They, live, they don't see God behind the universe. They see the universe and the amazing qualities of the universe and they worship it. Native American religions often did this. What Eastern religions often did this. Right? Um, a lot of religions worship the universe because it is the bride of God, the wife of God, the created form of God that God loves as his bride. Mother Earth. It's our mother. The Earth is our mother. And many religions worship the mother. But that is not enough. Yes, you should love your mother. But you should also, and more importantly, connect to your father. Now, until we die, we're not going to be able to connect to our father directly. Just like a baby cannot connect to his father directly until he's born. And then the father can actually hold him and love him directly. But in the womb, you can hear the voice of your parent. You can hear the voice of your mother and the voice of your father. The voice of your mother is closer. So the universe's voice to us, the principle that we live in, the universe that we live in, is right around us all the time, right? The mother. We're inside of our mother right now. But God's voice is right out there, right beyond this physical world. And you have to reach it. That's your job. And certain saints, like Jesus, who was the Son of God and Father, were able to penetrate, to hear God's voice. Maybe they were, they were born in their life, they were like right next to the wall or something. Like they were, or they could, somehow God was able to get them to hear his voice. Certain people throughout history have been able to hear the voice of God more clearly than others. Jesus, Father. And now we have to do the same thing. And the principles that Father teaches are based on his deep prayer and study over 10 years. He read the Bible so many times that, and he notated it, that some early observer said when he saw Father's Bible, he couldn't read it because Father had put little notes, so many little notes, with Chinese characters and Korean characters that it looked like little ants all over every page. Like every page was covered with, with ants. Like you could just turn, every page was like that. He had, and, and splotches where his tears had hit the page. For 10 years, he had, his Bible was like, he had read it thousands of times, you know, hundreds of times. He had read his Bible and praying over every word until God was able to reveal to him what, what the divine principle was. And men, more than women, can resonate with Heavenly Father because we're men. We're masculine. So we can resonate with Heavenly Father. And women can resonate with Heavenly Mother, or the Earthly Mother, the Universal Mother. So women are actually, their period cycle, right, is actually completely in time, you know, 28-day cycle, basically. Basically, you're tied to the tides. <laughs> you know, maybe you're, 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 you, your period comes in at the neap tide or the ebb tide or like flow. You, you're usually at the same time every month in a lunar cycle, in the cycle of the moon. So women are closer to the earth. That's why women decorate a home. If I were alone, when I was alone before, 
before I, you know, met Oman, before I got married and stuff. Men are just disgusting. We're slobs, A. And B, even if we're not slobs, even if we live neatly, we're simple. We don't decorate. There's no frills. There's no little beads hanging from things. It's very simple. I had a sleeping bag. I had a 10-speed bicycle, a beautiful one. And I had a guitar. And I had a backpack. <laughs> and what I could fit in the backpack. That's how much clothing I had. It was a real backpack. I mean, like a hiking backpack. So I could put a pretty good amount of clothes. But that's all I owned. And I didn't care. I was happy. I was completely happy. And men, well, you know men, they will wear the same clothing every day. Right? At school, didn't you see that? Guys will wear the same exact shirt and the same pants every day until it's like falling off of them. It's so gross. Or, like, or not so falling gross. off of them. That's right. It's like in Wayne's World, Garth says, it's like a new pair of underwear. At first, it's what is it? Constricted. It's first it's constricted, but then it becomes a part of you. <laughs> so, so men are gross. In other words, men are not connected to the physical world. We're not as connected to this world because we're not feminine. So we don't resonate with Mother Earth. We resonate with Heavenly Father more. That's why the Messiah had to come as a man. That's why Adam is subject. So we're getting back to our original theme, the evolution of Eve. It may be offensive to women. But it's great! Men and women are different! Hallelujah! Revelation! News flash! Men and women are different! News flash! Scientists discover men and women are different! <laughs> it's like, duh! But, you know, the, 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 we've lost that simple understanding that men and women are different! Because people mistake... The kids do this! It's got to be fair! It's not fair! Some now I've got something... You know, like they want, you want the exact same size ice cream, right? I've told this before. What's well, the only way to cut one piece of cake so that the two boys will not fight over who gets the bigger piece? What's the only way? What is it? Have one cut it. Your one kid cuts it, the other one chooses. Okay? As a parent, that's a little hint. You have one kid cut it, the other one chooses. You will never see so carefully cut a piece of cake <laughs> as that's like. <laughs> Because he doesn't want one side to be bigger, because he knows if he makes one side bigger, like, yeah, it's mine, you know. So it's like so it's so immature, right? But this is this is what we see today between men and women. Women are saying, if it's not equal, it's not fair. But the fact is that one person may eat more than another person, which means they should get a bigger piece, right? And one person may be younger, or maybe smaller, or whatever. In other words, you don't have to give the big I'm very brutal with my kids, right? When I, when I give out servings, I'm like, no, he gets more. Done. Shut up. You know? And I give more ice cream to the bigger ones or whatever. And, I, and or smaller kids that have to go to sleep soon. You know, I, each person's different. To treat different people the same is wrong. If people are different, you should treat them differently. Right? A teacher, as a teacher, you know this. That you cannot teach the same way to everyone in your class. One kid needs strong discipline. You have to be, we, we call it sit on it. That, that's what teachers say with each other. You gotta sit on that kid. You gotta really sit on it. It means you gotta completely control his behavior every minute. You have to look at him, uh, not, you know, watching him like this. And a good teacher knows how to do this. When, when administrators come in to observe, they're watching, as a teacher, how you, your classroom management, how you understand the different roles and relationships. And I got really high marks, except that I would let the kids I'm much more free than most teachers are. So I let the kids be a little nuts, you know, because I think it's a good environment for learning, you know, if, if you're more free. But administrators would be, at first, they'd be a little bit surprised by that and, yeah. and how the kids would sometimes be loud or, or talk back to me or something like that. I don't mind that so much. But when they're rude to each other or there's, I shut it right down, you know. But I'm aware of each kid's character. And you're like, no. Nah. And one, one kid may be so shy that you do that to them, they shut down completely. So a shy kid, you're constantly encouraging, you know, you know, you can do it, come on, let me hear you, okay, great job, right? And if, and if people are making fun of him because he's shy or something, then you shut them down loudly and directly. So everything's different. You can't treat different people the same. It's unfair to treat different people the same. It's unfair and wrong to treat men and women the same. Men and women are different. News flash. It's not just biological. 
Our biology and our spirituality are connected. God created us different. Thank you, God. Men represent Heavenly Father. Women represent Mother Earth. You represent the Earth women. You are representing the beauty. They're nurturing, giving life. Like the Earth. You plant a seed in the Earth and it grows. You plant a seed in the sun, it burns up. <laughs> if you, if, if, men destroy little kids. We we're not designed or built, really, to be that nurturing mother. We can find that in ourselves if we want to. And so we can actually adapt and change because we're spiritual beings. We, we can change. And we do have feminine, men have feminine nature within them. Women have masculine nature within them. The problem we're seeing in today's American society, and now it's spreading throughout the world, Europe is definitely on that way, is that women are trying to emphasize their masculine nature to the point that they're becoming men. They're becoming just like men. They're shutting down their femininity. And men, confronted with a world of women that are completely becoming masculine and tough, are becoming gay, becoming feminine, becoming more and more feminine, and finally becoming like soft and, and not wanting to intrude and not wanting to, because the women are so like bristly, you know, like, boom, what'd you say? You know, I just, I love movies as you can tell, but I, I just watched a movie called The Ugly Truth, which Rated R, you have to make sure that the kids aren't in the room. But, very funny, Catherine Hagel and uh, Gerard Butler. Very funny movie. And um, the woman who is, is playing the newscaster, and the new, uh, is married to the other newscaster, the husband and wife team. And, you know, the, Gerard Butler's playing this guy that's kind of a real guy, you know, a, ma a guy's guy, you know. And he's talking about how men are different from women, basically. And he's telling the woman that you've emasculated your husband, you, you, you've taken away his masculinity. And he's like, yeah, you've taken away my masculinity. And then so finally he gets them to love each other again. And it's nice to see he grabs her and he kisses her really strongly and then he carries her away on his shoulder. And, and you feel a happiness when you see a man loving a woman like passionately like that, <laughs> attacking a woman with love, you know? And a woman's like, a woman wants that actually. Women want to be loved, right women, right? You want to be loved. And men want to love. But when you're trying to be a man, men have no inroad to love you. And especially it's like they bristle when you, you, know, you try to love them, you know, like, who are you, you know? And Catherine Hagel in that same movie, they're having a meeting. And, you know, he comes in, Gerard Butler comes in for the first time, he's really rude and he's like saying all kinds of inappropriate things. And wasn't anyone there for the sexual harassment meeting we had last month? And the, the guy who's cash he didn't, he didn't sexually harass me, you know? <laughs> so the point is that women are like, sexual harassment, sexual harassment. They're calling sexual harassment all the time now. And now finally some women have finally admitted we're complicit in this. We've done just as much as the men have done in terms of creating this culture of like dressing sexy and coming on to the boss and trying to make him, you know, sleeping your way to the top. You know, so women, women are guilty of it, just as much as men, if not more so. So there's a double standard. They're, they're trying to be sexy and use their sexuality as a weapon to gain strength in the marketplace of men. But then they want to get really resentful if men come on to them. You can't have it both ways. And the whole thing of you know, so, and so women, women are, are, are living in this kind of, they're trying to create a double standard and they can't, it doesn't survive. And finally, women are even coming out now and saying women are just as complicit as men in this. And women know among themselves, they're catty with, right, with women, with, among yourselves, women like see what the other women are doing to the men. And they're like, you know, <laughs> because they, they see, the men are like, duh, you know, and the women are like manipulating the men, trying to get them to do what they want. So, it's not, the key is this, women have to become more feminine. They have to become women. Men have to be men. It's okay that we're different. Does that mean that women cannot work, cannot be in the marketplace, cannot be leaders, cannot be things like this? I think what it means, I'm not going to say yes or no to that. I'm going to say this. 
I think the course of life for a woman and a man is different. I think we end up in a similar place. But I think the course we go through in our life is different. A man, by his nature, is more masculine, is more outgoing. The true nature of man, coming from Heavenly Father, is outgoing, is reaching out into the universe, exploring, touching, investing, loving, creating, manipulating reality. Women's nature is to receive a man's love, to receive that and be a nurturing force of love and warmth and goodness to give to the children and to create a nurturing home, to create a home, a nest, and to nest and to give life to children and to take care of them and help them grow. And woman's nature is therefore different in the sense of almost unconditional acceptance. I want to unconditional love, I want to unconditional acceptance of children. Like the womb doesn't judge the child. It can be a it can be a child that is maybe has birth defects, right? But the womb will still try its best to take care of that child. It will not uh, throw that child away. Sometimes it does, though, right? There's miscarriages because there's a genetic abnormality, and the the womb will. Uh, miscarry that child. Actually, that does happen. But in many cases, most cases, it doesn't care if your nose is big or small, thank God. And it doesn't <laughs> care if you have brown hair or blonde hair. It doesn't care. It's going to give the same nurturing quality. Mothers are like that. Fathers are different. Fathers want you to reach perfection. They want you to be right and good and true. We set a standard. This is the true standard. Men think this way. Absolutely. We think of absolutes. And our position is very awkward in certain cir circumstances. A man like, you know, sometimes men are really rigid and everything's falling apart around them and they can't make adjustments. <laughs> you know, and women just roll their eyes at men who are like, like that. So there's weaknesses on both sides. But the point is that men's nature is to see God's point of view, this, this absolute point of view, the, the eternal law. The, the rules, the, the way it should work. And we, we, um, we create this kind of standard. And we expect you to meet that standard. And we don't care how long it takes, but we'll keep pushing you until you get there. You know, the distortion of that is like the coach that is like beating up on his kids. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you see, see that in the movie... Um, Whiplash. Whiplash, right? Mm -hmm. With uh, J.K. Simmons. He's great at acting in that. He won the Academy Award, actually, for Best, best Supporting Actor as a brutally, you know, meat, violent almost coach of um, J J Miles Teller, right, who's a drummer. So you see that kind of quality that men have where they can become too much controlling and you know, like this. And also you notice, if you see in families where there has not been a feminine presence, maybe the mother died or the children being raised only by a father, the children are like super nervous and they they judge themselves really harshly and they're very critical of themselves and critical of others. Children that grow up with only that strong masculine figure. And the opposite is true. Children that grow up with only a mother, which is much more common in, a, in America with single mothers and that kind of thing. Children that grow up with only mothers are sometimes get spoiled. Because they just, everything I do is, my mother loves me. I, everything I do is fine. I'm great. I'm good, you know. I'm perfect just the way I am, you know. And this kind of thing. And there's no sense of, I have to change. I have to grow. So you see that when a man raises children by himself, especially if he's a very strong, subjective man, maybe loving, but strong, subjective, you know, disciplinary, children sometimes grow up too tight. It's like they didn't get the nurturing from a mother that tells them, you're fine just the way you are. You're okay. But if they only have the mother who's, you're fine, you're okay, I love you just the way you are, then they get spoiled and soft and they kind of, they become weak because they don't have that masculine pressure. And same thing with plants. We think of the analogy of Heavenly Father and Mother Earth, of the sun and the earth. Then you think, uh, if a seed is planted in the soil and gets too much moisture and too much earth and not enough sunlight and warmth and air, it rots. Rots. So a child can rot if he doesn't get this strong masculine sunlight and air. But if you plant a seed where there's no water, no moisture, dry earth, it'll sprout and then it'll wither and die in just the heat and the air, the sun. So it needs both. Hello! We need men and women. And we need them to be different. Because children need men and women to be different. 
That's the ideal situation for children, is to be raised by a strong, vertical type father and a softer, warmer, nurturing mother. This is the ideal relationship. And because of the fall, that was lost. And we've been distorted. And we're not where we should be. My title this morning was The Evolution of Eve. Right? And I want to talk a little bit about the fall with, with women at, at, the, at the center of the idea of women's responsibility. I was, you know, for a long time, I thought that it's really men who want sort of this free sex, right? The idea of free sex was in the 70s, you know, the idea of, you know, and you could have sex with whoever you wanted, there's no consequences, no responsibility, right? And with, their, with birth control becoming more widespread, basically, people had sex with each other, they didn't care, they didn't think about children. They didn't. In the old days, you knew, or at least if you were raised by your parents, at least in any way correctly, you knew that if you had sex, you had children. Baby babies came from sex, right? Everyone knows that. And so there was a fear, and women especially were afraid of that because if they got pregnant, then they are the one who carries the baby. They're the one who has to raise that baby for many, many years. And if, a, if the husband's a, a teenage boy that they just had sex with in the back of the car, he's not going to step up and be a father most of the time. And that's where the idea of shotgun weddings came from. Do you know what a shotgun wedding is? The father of the pregnant girl comes to the boy's house with a shotgun. That's what it means. And he says, you're going to marry my daughter or you're going to die. You know, he goes, yes, sir. You know, and he marries his daughter and he's happy, they live happily ever after. That's a shotgun wedding. It means that the father of the, the girl who's pregnant goes to the guy and says, you're going to man up and do the right thing. That's not really ideal, though. Well, you know, no. So the point is that with birth control, the women become just as irresponsible as men. And I realized this, that my, I had an old-fashioned way of thinking. When you look at modern society, women are just as promiscuous as men are. And it puts the lie to this whole belief that it's a man who wants sex and the women want love and marriage, right? And I realized it, was, it comes down to Eve. Eve was the first one who wanted promiscuous, irresponsible sex. She was the one, before Adam, she was the one who was curious and exploring and wanting to receive love before it was time. And she got it from, Adam, from Lucifer, not from Adam. Adam wasn't ready to give it to her yet. So she went to the one who said he was ready to give it to her. He lied to her. He lied to her. And he, he made her believe that he would love her forever. Lie. He made her believe that it didn't matter who her love was with. Lie. And he didn't let her remind her that pregnancy and the responsibility of childbearing is a blessing. Pregnancy and childbirth and children are a blessing. Not to be avoided. It's a blessing in the right context. Obviously with a teenage boy in the backseat of a car is not the right time or place. But with a respectful, loving young man who wants to devote his whole life to you and your children, wow, total blessing. Of course, blessing and responsibility come together. But it's a blessing. In other words, we should want responsibility. We should feel that it's a blessing to have responsibility. Responsibility, in other words, is a blessing, not a burden. But when you're young, you just want the ice cream. You don't want to eat dinner. And so, that's why God gave the commandment. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't have sexual relationship with Eve until, you know, you're mature. So, Eve knew that commandment because she repeated it to Lucifer when he tried to tempt her. But she gave in. She caved. And she let him love her with his archangel love, which has no body, no seed. He can't give birth. You know, he can't give seed. He can't give a baby to her. And so she's left feeling empty after their sexual love, which is only on the spiritual level. She felt empty. 
And apparently it went on for some time. It wasn't just one time. It was going on until she felt more and more empty and she realized, I can't find my happiness in here. This is, I made a mistake. And she began to regret what she'd done. And she went to Adam, who she realized through that relationship was her true spouse. But she felt guilty and ashamed and afraid of God and of the punishment she might receive, that she would receive. And Adam didn't know that she'd fallen, didn't understand. And he fell into love with her, but like a boy that a girl, you know, pulls in with her tears and her, I love you, I need you right now. And then he falls in love with her. He, and he protects her, you know, and then he has sex with her. And she wraps him around his finger. Wraps him around her finger. So, so this kind of sick relationship was the foundation of our family on earth. We are the results. We are the children, great, great, great grandchildren of that couple. And that is in our souls and in our ancestry and all around us. And so, um, you know, that, that, has to be, that has to be fixed. Eve was the first one then to seek irresponsible love. Eve was the first. And then Adam was the second. Now, in our modern society, we're seeing Eve again as we come back to the point of the fall. This is the, this is the final thing. Please pay close attention to this. As we come to the final point where the fall can finally be restored, all those conditions are being brought back again. In other words, it's like the conditions right after the fall are being evident now everywhere. So we, we can... Face it and see it. It's no longer just an imaginary thing or a concept in the Bible or something. This is actual reality. A hundred years ago, when women were in Victorian England and were wearing corsets and things like this, and you didn't show any skin, and even an ankle was like, oh my God, she showed me her ankle. Woo! You know, that's sexy, you know? In, in those days, you didn't see Eve's real nature. It was being suppressed. And yes, so women today feel they were suppressed. We want to be free. And men are going, yeah. Fallen men. Because they, women don't realize that free sex is exactly what men, at least fallen men, want. A woman doesn't care about consequences and willing to have sex. But then if men do that, it's like Adam, if men do that, then they feel empty. Because that kind of childless love is not what a man wants. That kind of irresponsible, childless love that doesn't bring, bear fruit makes you feel empty as a man after a while. So, yeah, it takes about 10 years maybe to figure it out, which is a problem, isn't it? Because you make a lot of mistakes in that time, venereal diseases and unwanted pregnancies and abortions and all the damage to your heart that comes from feeling the emptiness and the tearing feeling. Up. Maybe you fell in love with her, but she didn't fall back in love with you, broken. Or she fell in love with you, but you didn't fall in love with her, broken. And all these broken hearts and that, that you bring, you, you come into your marriage like a wounded warrior, you know, all ripped up and torn up and damaged and limping and crippled. Not an ideal way to start a family. So the evolution of Eve. We're, we're seeing women going this cycle. Now they want to be like men. They want to be separate. We don't want to be oppressed. and no more suppression. We want to be free. But you cannot be free apart from a relation with man and woman. This is where your true freedom lies, is in the relation between man and woman. This is where you can be yourself. A man can be a man, a woman can be a woman, and there's love, and there's happiness, and there's children, and there's family, and there's joy. And one last thing I'll leave you with. When you make love, but you're only doing it physically, and you're kind of reenacting the fall, in other words, you only get out of the relationship what you put in. Garbage in, garbage out. You put in false love, you get false love back, you feel empty. Bleh. But when God is the center, one plus one equals three. Because your love meets your wife, and your wife's love meets you. And then God is the center, and God is blessing this union. And then his love comes into both of you. And then that makes your love greater. 
You actually have greater love than just what you put in. Because God is also invested. Because God can bless it. Because God recognizes it. This is true love. So that's why you have to have a blessed family. Because you want your love to be blessed by God. You want your relationship to be blessed by God. So the man and the woman loving each other is not just what they put in. But it's what they put in plus what God puts in. That leads to a surplus of love. And that becomes the children. The children are the result of a man and a woman, hopefully, I mean, if, they, if they really love each other, loving each other with God at the center, and then the extra love also goes out to the world, to the cosmos, to God himself. God feels love from a true family. So at home, the conclusion of our sermon is that you must you know, recognize that we are all part of the society, we've been influenced by the society, the trends in society, but we mustn't let the trends that we see in society, gender confusion and the loss of gender identity, we mustn't let, let that distort our thinking and derail us from following a heavenly way, which is always men are men, women are women. Their love relationship creates perfection with center on God. And that's a blessed marriage. That's why we call ourselves the blessed family sanctuary, because we were a blessed by Father. Father matched us together, and He blessed us together. And so our, and so our relationship has been blessed by God. And that blessing now Father wants to give to everyone in the world. So we have been, we've been given, commissioned by Father to give that blessing to our spiritual children. So if you want to get that blessing, I hope you can come to us and call us and we will educate you about what that means. And if you're ready to receive that blessing, we can bless you. And so you, you also can be a blessed family. So this is a blessed family sanctuary. A sanctuary, a safe place for blessed families. And that's why we pray in the name of Raman and Tamiko Montanaro, a blessed central family. So that this, you see how it all ties together, Father's teaching. So please join us in becoming a blessed central family. Become a blessed central family. Become a, a, set, a beautiful place. Gosh, we want the whole world to be like this. We want the whole world, every family, to be singing and beautiful. Wouldn't that be a wonderful world to live in? It's very peaceful, very calm. The kind of intense, angry struggle that we see in the gender identity confusion movement is so antithetical to the ideal world of love that God created, which is very peaceful and calm and beautiful. So let's, let's resist this trend, let it die out, like all trends will, this will also pass. This too shall pass, as the Bible says. Let's join in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being our parent. Um, we know that we are in the womb of Mother Earth, of, of the earthly universal mother right now, but that we can't wait, actually we can, I guess, <laughs> until we die, but we can't wait to see you face to face. But we can wait until we finish our 10 decades or so here, Father. But we hope that we can at least sense your presence and live the life that you want us to live here, that we can fulfill our responsibility, that we can be responsible, that we can welcome responsibility, Father, that we can welcome responsibility as your blessing, Father, that you've given us responsibility so that we can become like you, that we can become true, good, loving, responsible people, and that we can be your counterparts, we can be your children. Please bless this day. I ask you to bless God everyone here and everyone listening at home that this week can be blessed and that you can guide each one of us to fulfill our true original nature. We offer everything and we offer all these things in the name of Raman and Tamiko Montanaro, a blessed central family. Amen. Amen. Thank you.